case, uh, recognize it as the 40 days where Jesus uh, reflected in the desert before Easter. This also signifies the liturgical calendar for all days, uh, Christian days, days, and uh, also signifies the, the time when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, which are uh, the basic general rules of humanity, uh, which we should all follow. Please bow your head in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we appreciate this day. We understand and, and glorify your needs. We ask that you give us the guidance necessary to serve our humankind. We also ask that you care for, provide, and direct our military men and women, uh, both overseas and at home. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, Mr. Kramer or myself or Ms. 
Simpson. We'd all be happy to entertain any questions or comments that you have regarding the financial statement. In addition to that, there's a couple of items in the financial statement. Given the amount of outstanding bond and debt associated with, uh, with the authority, you know, we really would suggest that your bond council take a look at this to make certain that we as auditors have interpreted everything correctly and again, legal as well. So there's a couple levels of review that's left to be done. Um, as far as the audit process goes, on our end, if you were to ask us where we're at, we would say we're, we think we're, we're done. We think we've got it. Um, but again, we're going to be, that's all going to be pending some comments. Um, it, it's not my intention or Crystal's intention to, to walk you through this financial statement in, in um, uh, real fine detail. Uh, we can spend as much time on it as you would like, and we're prepared to answer any questions that you may have. Um, what I would like to do is ask you to, in fact, you don't even have to do this because I'll hold it up for you. Um, if you were to turn about three pages into the financial statement, you're going to come to a letter that says the independent auditor's report. This is what you were required to have an external and independent CPA provide. And this is our opinion on the financial statements for the authority since inception through September, really. Um, it's pretty wordy. If you were to read it, a lot of people can read it. And unless you're a numbers person, you see a lot of these, you don't understand it. This is a clean opinion. That's <laughs> the most important thing that you need to know. Okay? It's, um, we now refer to it as unmodified. Um, but essentially, at the end of the day, it is a clean opinion. It only talks about this statement. It doesn't talk about the process. It doesn't talk about the quality of the books and records. It doesn't say anything about the cooperation we got during the audit process. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Crystal and I like to come and actually talk to um, the boards directly, is to let you know that we really did receive what I would refer to as you know, open book um, uh, hospitality <laughs> um, and cooperation on the part of everybody associated with the authority. So we had to go to the energy contract and the invoice, anything that we needed, it was all there. The books and records were ready for us, they were prepared. And this audit work, even though we're here in February, is really done in December. Okay, uh, it's just really kind of a matter of the timing with respect to um, the meeting dates. Um, Crystal's gonna come up in just a second and talk about the numbers, which is a couple of financial highlights. A few things that I asked, you too, if, if you had the time to maybe spend a little bit of time with after the meeting today. Um, after our independent auditor's report letter, which really that's ours, so the, the wording on that can't necessarily be adjusted. But you come to a letter that says management's discussion and analysis. And the purpose of this letter is really meant more for the community and for your bondholders to pick up and read and hopefully in layman's terms explain exactly where the authority is at as of September and where you're going going forward. Um, again, this was uh, prepared by the KW, KW management. Um, so if you had any suggestions or comments, I'm sure that they would be very happy to, to hear them. Um, I've heard it said that some people would say that the management discussion and analysis letter is one of the best, if not the only, external communication tool that you have to residents or, or other people who are impacted, of course, by this statement. Um, and I agree with that. I mean, it really does, it puts it in English. Um, unless you have a newsletter that you're sending out or information on your website to you know your update, this is a really good resource to make certain that uh, you feel it's accurately reflecting the operations of the authority. And then lastly, in the very back, behind the financial statements, and again, you don't have to turn to it, I'm not gonna ask you to, um, but there is a separate letter of comments from Plan Moran. Um, at the completion of every audit, no matter what audit, uh, the auditors are required to give to those charged with governance, which is the authority board, a letter explaining the audit process and how it went. Um, if you were to read this in detail, what you would see is that we basically are saying the audit process went very smoothly. Um, there are two technical issues, which is really items that we're asking legal counsel and bond counsel to take a look at, just to make certain that they're uh, comfortable with the conclusions that we've reached. And then once that's done, this is done. Most important thing to know is what's not in here. And if we had any journal entries, uh, we would be coming to you and saying, hey, you know, we have significant deficiencies in material weaknesses. Some of you, your communities may hear those terms uh, brought up when those audits are presented. Uh, we had in, in, uh, with respect to, to this audit. So you have a clean opinion, and you have no material weaknesses, and no significant deficiencies. And so with that, 
I will turn it over to Crystal, who will cover this couple of the numbers. Great. If you turn to the statement of net position, it's on page six. Um, this is your balance sheet as of September 30th, 2014. Um, as you can imagine, at the, the point that you're at with the construction phase, um, a lot of the significant amounts on your balance sheet are related to the capital asset, the construction and progress for the pipeline, um, the deposit with the pipe supplier. So you don't have to send money over every single invoice. You have some deposits on hand for them to um, to pay for the, the pipe and then provide you the support, um, as well as the, the long-term debt um, that offsets that capital asset. So that's how you're funding um, the construction phase of the pipeline. Um, it does look a little odd if you look in the equity section. You can see that um, net investment capital assets. Uh, if you've ever looked at a, your financial statement, I'm sure you're used to seeing a positive number there. Um, the reason that that's negative of about 1.8 million is you have your capital asset and related debt, but you also have a, a premium that you're amortizing over the life of your bond. So um, at some point in time, those will shore up and come together, but just due to the, the phase that you're in, those aren't exactly lining up like you normally would see. And then you have the unrestricted net position of about $3.6 million. If we look at the next page, page 7, um, this looks, takes a look at your revenue, expenses, and then your changes in net position. Um, you can see you don't have a lot of operating revenue coming in because you're not um, in, the, in the service of providing water at this point. Um, you did have some sale of plants and specs of about $5,000. Um, which was offset by some, you do have to have some operating expenses in order to um, keep your, um, keep going in your office uh, duties of about 139000 So your operating loss was about 134000 um, and that will continue until the pipeline is, is up and running. In the non-operating revenue and expense section, you'll see that um, contract operating subsidy of about $3.7 million. Um, that's the seed money, if you will, to get it up and going. And then you'll see the, the bond issuance cost of about $1.7 um, related to the debt issuance um, for the, the construction of the pipeline. So overall, your income was about $1.9 million, again, which was largely related to that operating <coughs> subsidy. Um, and if you compare this to your internal statements that you were used to seeing on an ongoing basis, um, you would have seen a lot of that capital, um, those capital costs expensed you're used to looking at it on a budget basis, but for gap purposes on full accrual, you have to recognize those as capital assets, and once they're up and running, you'll start depreciating them over their useful lives. On page eight is just a statement of cash flow, so you can see on a cash flow basis the money that came in um, and, and where it went during the year. And then starting on page nine, start your footnotes. Um, these just provide explanations for the items that are on your balance sheet and income statement. So again, we won't spend a ton of time going through them, but if you have any questions, either now or as you're going through them later, you can feel free to reach out and contact us and we'll be happy to, to go through those with you. Are there any questions? We'll just, yeah, we'll start. Uh, Trustee Green, do you have any questions or comments? No, there's not. just comment. Uh, Trustee Curtis. Trustee Chucker? Um, just one question. You said it was unqualified. Uh, unqualified. It, it's, the terminology used to be unqualified, and they thought that sounded like a negative connotation, so now it's referred to as unmodified, which just means we didn't come across anything during the audit that would require us to modify our opinion. So you have a clean opinion. That's fine. Right. Where is that stated in here? Um, you won't see a specific terminology, unfortunately. <laughs> um, it just says, uh, uh, based on our opinion, are providing an opinion that your financial statements are free of material misstatement, which means unmodified. Otherwise, I would say, except for we've qualified our opinion for X, Y, or Z, but we don't have that. Where is that in your letter in the back? The very last sentence on page one. So the, the letter that's in the front. At the very end. Yes. So your letter on your opinion doesn't say your opinion. Oh, it does. The, the bottom paragraph there, in our opinion, basic financial statements and all material respects is that your financial position. If there were modifications, then those would be within that paragraph. I was just asking because in your opinion at the back, you had the two questions. Are you waiting for an answer on that? Is that why this was debated? Right. Okay. Yeah, because we're waiting on confirmation that the 
you know, the facts can be cumulative are accurate. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. I, um, there's only two other quick comments that, that I would uh, like to make real quick. First off, I want to thank the KWA for all the assistance that they gave us in the process. You know, there wasn't a ton of numbers here, obviously, but there were a lot of combinations, believe it or not. We had documentation that we must have. So that we had to discuss during this process because you know, you're setting up a formulating this for the initial year. There's a lot of formatting questions, questions with respect to bonding, tax interest costs, amortization. I can bore you to tears with it, but there was really a lot of questions that needed to be addressed that once they're uh, addressed will be carried forward down for a number of years. So things will get substantially easier after this year as a result of this time. So thank uh, everybody at KWA for your patience. And then uh, my last comment would be, because, because it's fairly unusual, if you were looking at the footnote, um, you, you have a significant amount of cash that's remaining to be spent. And all of that cash is secured uh, and insured, which is, again, at the community level, that would be somewhat unusual to see. You would see communities insuring all their uh, assets. In your case, you know, your, the $300 million that's here at the end of the year, all of that was fully insured. So all that, you took the extra step to make sure that those all important assets are protected. Thank you. The last question that I have before we finish, um, I often get questions about uh, how much does the KWA owe um, on its bonds. Um, so I would just, I know I have it in front of me, but if I could from you, um, point us to the page where people who are interested in information about the, the bonds and the debt liability, where that can be found. Sure. Uh, if you look at note five, which is on page 14, uh, this gives detail for the, the bond, the ending balance, as well as the, the balance on the premium, which I said would be amortized over the life of your bond. Um, and then on the following page, page 15, you can see the future maturities by year uh, of what will be paid on that debt, including principal and interest. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Right, we'll close this part of our agenda. Again, this is a draft that was pre presented for informational purposes uh, since it is our, our first uh, formal body. Uh, this will, when finalized, be made available uh, to the public uh, as other public bodies while it's already here. So thank you for your service. The, the next item on our agenda, item three, uh, I'll turn to our, our CEO, uh, Jesse County Planning Commissioner Jeff Wright. We have a, an update uh, on the construction of the, of the pipeline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The update is it's very cold. Before I start that, I'd like to uh, thank Paul Herring again for coming today. Mr. Herring's uh, videotaping everything KWA does at the public level so that we can have it on Channel 17 so the people that cannot attend these meetings have access to the information and the people that attend. I'd also like to uh, welcome Ryan Birchmeyer and Bob Cole and Marsh Canale Township officials from the different communities in Genesee County, uh, Councilwoman Vicki Van Buren and Councilman Eric Mays and Carrie Nelson. Thanks for coming today. It's good to see that you're interested in what's going on with KWA. And former Councilman and new Commissioner, uh, excuse my abbreviation for BB Nolan, but BB, thanks for coming today. Now I uh, know that some of the council people have saw seen part of this. Um, presentation. There are some new photos and some new information available. Um, we'll go through this fairly quickly. These are the five core communities, again, that are members of Genesee County, Lapeer County, San Juan County, and City of Flint, City of Lapeer, and that shows basically the service area. This is the competitive bids that we took for the different portions of this project. On the left-hand column, you can see the estimated cost by the engineers. On the right-hand column is the actual competitive bid price. I think uh, one of the bigger ones is the number two pipeline. The estimate initially was $104 million. That came in at $79 million. And the big plus with that is, is American Cast Iron and Pipe, who uh, was the low bidder, 
of the three bidders on this project also constructed a brand new manufacturing facility at the former New York City site. They're currently up and running and producing pipe at that facility. Another interesting note is the bond interest. You'll see on the left column that we used a 5% interest rate from the beginning on this project in our estimates. The actual bid came in at 4.72%, and several notes on that. Number one, it's a great interest rate considering the financial conditions of the state of Michigan, number one, when this bond was sold, and the fact that the city of Flint was in an emergency manager status, the 4.72 bond rate was an excellent rate. That 28 basis points difference actually relates to almost $30 million in interest that we won't have to pay on this project over the life of the bond. And as you can see, there are many more uh, bids. They all came in below or at the engineer's estimate, and we're very, very satisfied with the way the bids came in. This is the tunneling machine that poured out underneath the lake. This is a real quick demonstration of how this works. It's like a giant drill bit, uh, an 84-inch diameter drill bit. This is retrieving that same machine from uh, the westerly push from the lake. It pushed a couple thousand feet. Now they're taking this up and they're going to put it back in their, their uh, tunneling pit and push it out underneath the lake. And this is retrieving that machine from the bottom of Lake Huron. Um, largest barge on, lake, on the Great Lakes currently was working on this project. Quite a sight. Um, I wish I could have been there to see that come on. This guy is now walking on water. But as much as he gets paid, he should be. Um, the reality is the divers on these projects get close to $600 an hour, whether they're in the water or not. And we just happened to catch him just as he was hitting the water. He's not really walking on it. Another picture of the service barge along the uh, barge that retrieved the, the actual tunneling machine. This is the intermediate pump station. You see that pipe at the end? That's a person standing in the end of the pipe, I believe. Can't tell from here. But it's a big pipe. It gives you some some uh, context to the size that's almost 58 feet in the ground. This is the lake pump station that will pump untreated water to the city of Flint water treatment plant and to the Genesee County water treatment facility. Another shot as they bring it up out of the hole, they pour sections, remove the forms, pour the next section. Another shot um, coming out of the ground. Another shot of all the re-rod that's used in these facilities. Once these are built, we certainly expect them to last 100 years minimally, if not close to 150 years. Another shot of the same site. Uh, re-rod people. This is because we're moving into winter. The first shots you saw earlier were summer and fall construction. Now that we're moving into winter, they've literally had to tent these two pump station sites so that the concrete cures properly and that we can work through the winter, which is an important part to try to not only keep us on schedule, but try to move up the completion schedule if possible. Again, uh, the same site, probably 40 feet of that building you don't see now because it's been backfilled around it and you can see the tenting around it um, so they can pour their concrete and keep it warm. This structure is the one that actually sits over the top of the intake pipe. It's the valve that we can turn, turn on and turn off the pipe that's out underneath the lake. This is the cribbing that uh, was this that was constructed at the site. This actually sets over the end of the pipe to protect it from ice flows. This is another shot of it before they launch it into the water. Huge, huge, but it protects it from ice flows. 
from errant steamers that, or ships that may go off course and hit it and basically to protect the, protect the system. Uh oh. And this is Kevin Sylvester, my technical guy, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> we had a little video of that launching. Maybe we can pass that. Of course, this was a nice warm day. This is next to the lake. You can see a freighter going by in the background. And it's so heavy that the largest crane we had out there cannot pick it up, so they literally have to launch it like a ship. That will be floated out to the intake and ballast stones will be placed in the holes in the top and it will be sunk over the intake. There's actually two of these. I'll show you another one in a moment. You can also see the current there. It's pretty strong. Okay, good. same water that we launched in a few months ago, now it's packed with ice. The second cribbing, which is enclosed in plastic at this point in time, is underneath that ramp. And come spring, come the thaw, then we'll launch that one in the place of the inlet also. This is a picture of the actual 66-inch diameter pipe that's being manufactured in Flint, Michigan. It's not being put together in Flint, Michigan. This is, John, is this over near the lake station or the intermediate? It's intermediate. This is the intermediate pump station where they're going from 66 inch diameter to 60 inch diameter. Um, and this is a process that they use to help seal the joints. The joints are welded joints. This is all steel pipe. Again, life expectancy in excess of 100 years. Uh, and then on the outside, they put this shrink wrap that helps in the corrosion protection of that particular joint. This is the intermediate pump station in Lynn Township, close to Reed or Roger City? Roger City? Brown. Brown City. Yeah, it's close. They all look the same on the middle of the thumb. Very, very desolate. So this is the intermediate pump station coming up out of the ground. This particular pump station is being built by a Flint company, E&L uh, Construction. E&L has been in Flint since the mid-40s, and uh, they're employing Flint people. As a matter of fact, there are over 900 people currently working on this project. Over 700 of those people are from Flint and Genesee County. We will peak at about 1,100 people this spring working on this project, again, the vast majority coming from our community. This is the inside of the intermediate pump station. The workers putting up the farms, uh, pouring concrete. Again, they had to tent the whole facility uh, so they could continue to work through the wintertime. Again, our goal is to get this in as quickly as possible. And uh, another shot of that site. Another shot of that site. Basically, they tend and they run heaters inside so the temperature doesn't fall below 50, 60 degrees. So the concrete cures properly. Uh, laying rebar, more rebar. A lot of steel in this project. Compacting sand and laying rebar. This gentleman brought back a lot of memories for me. Uh, he's a black person, honestly. One of the first jobs I ever had back in way back uh, was this flag person. Now I've got to tell you, it's, of all the jobs on a construction site, to me it was the hardest. You have to stand there in the heat of the day in the summertime. You have to stand there in the dead of the wintertime, in the rain, the snow, the sleet, the wind. 
You are also responsible for every car, that truck that comes by there. Most of those people aren't too happy when they come by you, so they're usually saying something. But the mental stress level of that job, the physical ability to stand there every day through all those different weather conditions, I prefer being a laborer down in a hole shoveling dirt, and that's where I ended up. So I give kudos to the flag people on this job. Next time you drive by one, Say something nice to him. <laughs> this is late summer, Zito's portion of the pipeline. This is the pipe that will connect the City of Flint water treatment plant to the uh, station that will feed it out of the LaPierre Genesee County line. This is a ductile iron pipe. This is the larger diameter pipe being delivered to the lake pump station, looks like to me. The lake pump station, this is uh, some of the ductile iron pipe being delivered to the Zeo job in Genesee County. Put a lot of truck drivers to work too on this project. Again, uh, Zeo line 36 inch pipe, set the manhole on that same pipe facility. Another construction shot. Another one. This is a unique area on Stanley Road, just east of the city of Flint. We have to, because the soil conditions for about 700 feet are so poor, we actually have to sink pilings in the ground and then lay a pipe on the pilings to support the weight of the pipes because the soils are so bad. This is one of the larger cranes in the state of Michigan currently, and they'll be sinking the miles over the next couple of weeks and uh, actually laying that pipe shortly thereafter. The Zito portion, well, I take that back. I've got, we've got the map in there to show us. Okay, go ahead. This is what they call casing, or, or uh, used for tunneling underneath roadways. They use this to bore underneath roadways in short pushes two to 300 feet, and they put the pipe inside of it. Another shot of working on the larger pipe, my assumption is that's at the Lake Pump Station. Uh, it's getting ready to set a fire hydrant. One of the things that KWA is bringing to the rural areas is fire suppression capabilities. Currently, you have a flood fire on the rural part of Genesee County or Lapeer County or San Juan County. You have to find an open water source to get the water to fight the fire. There will be a hydrant set at least every mile, the full length of this, will, which will greatly improve the fire suppression capability of this whole region of the state. Setting that hydrant, one of the hydrants. Uh, access manual. Starting as soon as the frost comes out of the ground, their portion of it. 
The yellow section is Diagostini again. They plan on working two crews on that. And the purplish pink section is the Zito section. And they um, are about 70% complete on that section. Then you have the intermediate pump station that's being built by, again, e &L Construction, and the late pump station uh, being done by the Augustinian Sons. All either local contractors to Flint, Genesee County, or to Southeast Michigan. Two particularly, Zito and e &L are from the Flint area. I'd also point out that 90% of the engineering, surveying, soils testing, is being done by Flint companies, Row, Weight Trim, Kraft, uh, etc. So a lot of people locally working on this project. That was it. Any questions you may have? Jeff, are we within our projected timeline? Yes, sir. Uh, our goal has been and always will stay June of 2016 to have the pipeline and pump stations up and running to supply Flint with raw water. The county's system will not be ready for another six months after that, approximately, because we have to build a treatment plant from scratch. But the pipeline, the goal again is to have it up and running by June of 2016. If we have exceptional weather from this point on, and we can encourage the suppliers to get material to us at a faster pace, then it's possible we could shave a couple of months or so, or a few months off of that June 2016 timeline. But at this point, we're certainly on time to make that easier. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank the board um, and the folks that came to watch today. Our number's in the book. I got cards here. If there's any questions from the audience at any time, you're more than welcome to call the office, ask for me, and we talk all the time. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, CEO Wright. Uh, you'll see on the agenda that this particular meeting, uh, we meet on a regular schedule. Uh, we have nothing on our consent agenda on old business or new business which brings us to our public comment period. Uh, the KWA is a public body. We have public comment at every one of our meetings. Uh, I will note that in the event that uh, public comment has a specific uh, question or request for information, uh, those of us who may be able to respond to that will be taking notes. Uh, immediately following the close of the public comment period, we'll move to a board comment period and we'll make sure to address any of the questions or issues uh, that, that you may have raised, but we won't, uh, we won't have a dialogue during the public comment period. Uh, we have a good tradition here on this body of addressing any questions or, or issues that come up, and, and we're certainly here for as long as we need to be. Uh, so with that, I'd like to open the, the microphone to uh, public comment for anyone who'd like to address this, this body. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Heron. I reside at 525 Mason Street. I'm a regular council speaker, so I don't know if that information was necessary or not. I just have a question, and actually at the tail end of your presentation, Jeff, you brought it up. You said that the county is building its own water treatment plant, and I'm wondering why they're doing that instead of using the one we already have.
and it's from residents. Well, the people that I talked to, and that's a lot of people, they never knew that they could get hired on with this pipeline. How many minorities is on this pipeline? Uh, another question, uh, when you all were uh, getting uh, construction companies and vetting them, L, what is it, L, the Augusty uh, was indicted along with Kilpatrick, it was named in that. Uh, is there any way that we can get paperwork showing how y'all went through this process of picking the construction companies for this project? Also, uh, on here, I see where they have a debt retirement investment account, debt reserve investment account, and construction fund investment account. Uh, could I find out uh, what does, is that holding uh, right there? Do, do you receive interest off of that? And who received that? Who receives the interest money from that? And also, when the pipeline is built by Flint putting in almost what, about $100 million, how do you go about uh, if Flint paid into it? How, do you, how does Flint receive any funds if someone else buy into morning water from this pipeline? Right? And lastly, uh, and I forgot my question that quick. Oh, Article 5, it states that if the pipeline is, uh, you dismantle the pipeline, the board can vote to dismantle it. Who owns the pipeline? Is it privately owned? What happens when the board states that they no longer want this pipeline? What happens? Do Flint get that $100 million back that they paid into it? or does it go to the private owners, which is a, a Karagandhi Water Authority. Thank you. Sir, uh, we have your name, please, for the record. Arthur Wilson. Thank you. And the next to the last question. We got all the questions except the next to the last. The last one is the next to the last one. Just, just uh, let receive payment on um, future by future by. Yes. Thank you. Good, good uh, questions. Hello, everybody. Anthony Palladino, uh, 1383 Washington Avenue, East Side of Atlanta. Uh, a couple of questions. This pipeline is just running through the pier and all that. Are they committed to us? I mean, as, as we stand in Flint, we're getting our water from Detroit, or we're, we got, we, we jumped off that ship. Are, are there a lot of people committed to this pipeline? And if so, is that going to save the residents money? in the long run. Also, I want to know, what is the environmental impact on these properties that this pipeline is coming over? And who owned the property prior to the pipeline coming through it? And is any of this money going to be put back into the system's pockets? Do you see rates falling because of this? And let's say we get in a situation where this quality of water is where it is now. Where is that going to leave us for protection as residents of the city? Yeah, good evening. My name is Eric May, First Ward City Councilman for the City of Flint. I'm glad to see the Karagandi Water Authority meeting in Flint today. I went to one out at the um, commissioner's office. I've been to one here, and I know they meet all over, but when you stop by the City of Flint, I try to pay attention. I would say that Commissioner Green um, is probably sitting in the lucky seat. But anyway, my, my, my comments and questions will follow the set. Um, the payments, and I know I can always get these answers from President Green, Mayor Wallen, City of Atlanta, Commissioner. Um, Curtis, Chairman Curtis, but when does the Flint payment start and how much are they if they haven't already started? When? How much? I think I remember somebody said it to me annually. Um, also, since we've had the water.
issues with the city of Flint as we attempt to treat Flint with river water adequately. I've told people I've had to learn a little about water, like Forrest Gump had to learn about shrimp. And so in that knowledge, I've heard something about and treated water at the point of intake from the lake. And I want to know if anybody knows if it's true that Detroit treats water at the point of intake. And as I look at the city of Flint, Genesee County is building a treatment plant. I don't know if there's merit to treating water at the point of intake. And I don't want us to stumble as we build treatment plants and treat water. I know some people want raw water for agricultural purposes, but my interest is safe drinking, shower, and bathing water. And I've heard researchers tell me that, you know, they say, put it in common terms, Mace. They say, if you take water from the lake and you take it away from the oxygen and sunlight and it travels miles in a tunnel, living organisms poop and do different things and it's a different treatment. I don't know if that has merit, but I do know that I want the Karagandi to look and answer questions for me as we move toward sending raw water, treated or untreated, to the treatment plant that we already have. I also look at the American Pipe Company, and I don't know what their relationship is with the Karagandi, but the Karagandi is a quasi-type of uh, authority. You got people from various counties, the city, and I looked at the edicts and I seen about a $20 million difference. And I heard Mr. Wright say that that pipe company is the supplier of pipe. And as I look at Flint as a part of the Caribbean, and I look at these relationships, and I understand a little bit about financing and tax breaks and write-offs, I said to myself, these relationships of pipe, because they keep talking about our infrastructure, 600 miles of pipe underground. Money from the government, two million leak detection, so forth and so on. But it looked like we're running a foot race to do our Flint infrastructure, which might have nothing to do with the other counties. This might be directed toward the Karagandi in the sense of people who have an interest in Flint, Tennessee County, the mayor. And I said, I can see as a visionary the 20 million less projected. It was 100 and some million projected, 80 some million, and I think was the actual bid for the pipe. I said, that American Pipe Company is going to have a lot to do with our infrastructure in the city of Flint, whether it's going to be some in-kind tax write-offs, whether it's going to be some reduced cost in bids, but that pipe company is going to have something to do with it. So since I have an opportunity to talk to elected officials and deal with people privately, I'll make my public comments and questions about that with the understanding that I'm articulating a vision, not only for the Karagandi, but for one of the primary customers of the Karagandi, whether I like it or not, because decisions are made, pipes are being laid, and water will be on the way. And so, I'll see what happens. Mr. Wright, when we talk about if everything goes right and I talk to you, that December or earlier date, whether it's January, February, March of 2016, or whether we go all the way to June of 2016, 
I look at that, and Mayor Waller, I look at the advisory committee on Waller, and I see Mr. Wright over there, I see the commissioners, Mr. Curtis, and I see a whole lot of people, and some of that is co-mingling, but I'm here to tell you, Mr. Wright, Mr. Curtis, and anybody else from the Karagandhi, the Karagandhi wasn't listed, and you know, I know we didn't pay for some consultants and we'll get their report later. But I've gotten good advice on Wild from Mr. Wright. I've got good advice from Wild on Bob, from Bob Stewart. I've got good advice on Wild from Bob Bocock, who was sitting here by environmentalist Aaron Brockovich. I've got good advice on Wilder from Google about trihalomethane and so forth and so on. Google works. And so my point is this. As we set up advisory boards, some of the people overlap. And as we try to do something in the interim, whether they finish early or not, I believe that quality wild Mr. Miller, is key yesterday and today, and the decisions need to be made. So I use this form in your spot as a chairman, Mr. Mayor, to say that you know the details of Lake Huron Water as it relates to the other source, which is Detroit, the river water, the treatment plants, the problem we have now, the end expertise in the chemicals. And if there's anything that this board can do to bring in consultants about treatment as it relates to, I know y'all just dealing with the raw water, but the Karagandi is the supplier of raw water and don't leave the city of Flint and the residents I represent to gather this information on our own. Even the county of Genesee, um, Mr. Curtis, has an interest as it relates to treatment plants, the chemicals used therein, and the knowledge gained. So somewhere before we get to the actual application, I would suggest from what I've learned, people have made mistakes in the plant. Point of treatment, expertise on chemicals used, I would like to see some of that come before the board before we start getting to the real distribution. I would hate to see us make some of the same mistakes in the Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Mace. Other comments? <coughs> My name is Leanne Walters. I live at 212 Browningham in Flint. I have quite a few questions. Was the original plan where the water's coming in from Lake Huron supposed to be a controlled source of water, meaning not open to the environment? Because after doing some research, it shows that that's changed and it's going to be a lake basin now instead. And if that's true, how, are, how is that different than using the Flint water? How is that going to be regulated? How is the people not going to swim on it, bait, you know, boating, fishing, birds, etc.? How is the increased size? in the pipe from what we're used to from Detroit to what it's going to now, how is that going to affect water to the community? The original is 112 to 72. With KWA, it's 36 to 18, with eight inches being taken up for the common loop. So what does that do to our water? Why aren't there any water specialists on the KWA board? How does the public get a copy of the contract to show what collateral has been used to obtain the bonds? to finance this project. Have they tested Lake Huron's water and the Flint treatment plants? If they have one, how do we get a copy of those results? Uh, why isn't there a treatment plant at the intake of the water with this being done? So that it's being treated from right from the source instead of waiting until it gets down the line. How do we protect the people from this not being sold to a private company a few years down the road? How do the people trust that? What, what, has, what comes into play to protect us as the citizens? 
And what is, there, what is your estimated cost per acre foot to the citizens of Flint? Treated and pumped, final cost. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Second and final call for comments before we close. Okay, seeing none, we'll uh, close the, the public comment for this meeting, and then we'll, of course, be available at future meetings. As some of my trustees will remember, when we also had a lot of public comment at our first meeting in Worth Township in, in Sandlack. Uh, so this is the purpose of this body, is to have these meetings in each of the communities where we have uh, stakeholders and affected citizens, and residents, and businesses, so that we can have an open uh, dialogue. Uh, and if there's no objection from the from the board, I would actually first like to ask our legal counsel uh, to come to the microphone and just um, remind all of us the, the legal construction of the KWA authority. Uh, we had some questions about it, its nature as a public body or in the state it is a quasi-public body, can be privatized. Uh, I think it's important for everyone to understand the, the state law that this body is organized under and the authorities which were, were granted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Karagandi Water Authority has been created under Act 233 of 1955, which allows multiple governmental jurisdictions to form an authority for a specific purpose. In this case, it's water. So the purpose why we were created for KWA was to deliver water for drinking, ag business, and so forth to the various municipalities that it can service. I believe one of the questions was on dissolution, the assets, and so forth. Just so everybody's aware, the assets actually owned by KWA, the asset being owned by it. And in order to dissolve KWA, it takes a unanimous vote of the five incorporating members, which is the city of Flint, city of Lapeer, county of Genesee, county of Lapeer, and the county of Sandy. So it takes a unanimous vote of those five units of government to dissolve KWA. If in fact that would happen, then the authority board, being the 15 members that are sitting here today, decide how those assets are distributed. However, in no case can the authority be dissolved if it has outstanding contracts to provide water. And that is all located in the article of incorporation. Other questions, Mayor? Unless there were others for you, I think that was that was the one I wanted you, you to address so that everyone had the same understanding. Um, that we often, especially as people might see this on the news or, or read about it, they might see terms like you know, partnership or, or collaboration. And we certainly operate in the spirit, but we're organized under state law yes. for a specific purpose. When we come together here, we're not individual members of other communities. We, we are here under oath to a fiduciary responsibility uh, to this particular authority. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, now again, if, if there's not objection, we, we did have a large number of, of technical and financial questions. Uh, I'd like to ask our CEO, uh, Jeff Wright, to, to respond to those as he's able here today. And, and then certainly if there I know there were a couple questions specifically about city of Flint operations and estimates uh, that, I, that I can speak to a bit later, but can also uh, provide some further information on the same may be true for our CEO. We may have follow-ups uh, to get with people on some of their specific questions. We've often posted those on the authority's website so that that information is publicly available following the meeting. Uh, CEO. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, start with Mr. Herring's question about the Flint water treatment plant. I'll talk about a couple of questions that were brought up about water treatment. Why a later, well, the young lady asked about why didn't we build a treatment plant at the lake? Well, these two kind of go together. Number one, the city of Flint water treatment plant does not have the physical capacity to produce enough water to supply Flint and Genesee County. The Flint River itself does not have enough physical capacity 
to supply Flint and Genesee County with water, even if the treatment plant did have that capacity. Why we didn't build a treatment plant at the lake and pump raw or treated water over to Flint and Genesee County is it would um, throw away existing infrastructure. One of the main reasons for bringing untreated water to the city of Flint is so that the city could utilize its existing water treatment plant that they put $50 million into over the last 15, 20 years. So it was a two-fold issue. One, to utilize existing infrastructure and not replicate with new infrastructure, infrastructure already had. And two, the Flint River does not have the physical capacity to supply Flint and Genesee County from that site. That's why Genesee County is building its own water treatment plant at its own expense with no financial input from the city of Flint. Uh, Mr. Woodson uh, had several questions. I hope I got them all. Um, as far as who a contractor and how a contractor ends up on these projects, these are competitive bids. Any contractor that is a licensed contractor that can get the funding, or excuse me, the bonding and the insurance coverages to do this type of work has the legal ability to bid this work. We had several sealed bids. Those bids were kept sealed until the day they were opened in front of all the contractors. And any contractor that has one of these projects won that sealed bid process. They were the low bidder out of many contractors that did the project. The fact that uh, there's a labor ready supplying some of the uh, person power to some of these projects, that's totally up to the contractors themselves on who they hire. Most of them hire out of the building trades, actually. Most of the people working on this project come from the building trades, uh, the local building trades at that point. Who the contractors hire is something that's between the contractors and their employees. The contractors bid with us. We do require a prevailing wage clause in our contracts, and we do give a bonus for contractors that hire local people. So we put all the incentives in the contract that are possible. And uh, in many cases, it's mostly local people working on these projects. But it's up to the contractor who they hire. KWA and its body cannot tell a contractor who they have to hire and who they don't. As far as minorities go, all you have to do is drive out to any of these construction sites. I think Mr. Beebe or Nolden has been out to them and has pointed out publicly before that he's been impressed with the diverse workforce that we have on these construction sites. So, although there's no technical reason or legal reason to monitor how many uh, minorities and or women are working on these sites, we're very pleased with the diversity that is out there. Uh, if another community were to, again, this is uh, questions from Mr. Woodson, if another community wanted to buy capacity in the system, then they could buy capacity from whoever owns capacity in the system currently. There's only two communities that currently own capacity in the system, at City of Flint and Genesee County. If another capacity, if city wanted to buy capacity, they would have to buy it from both of us. They can't just, we can't make up new capacity and sell something that hasn't uh, been part of books. We've got a 60 million gallon contract uh, of which 18 million, is that correct? There are 18 million, the city of Flint purchased, 42 million, Genesee County purchased, and that also was reflected in how much is paid by each community. Genesee County is paying 70% of the total cost of this project. Flint's paying 30% of the total cost of this project. If there were to be capacity purchased, it would be from that original 60 million gallons um, that is purchased by Flint and Genesee County. If, I 
believe another question from Mr. Woodson was interest earned. Where does the interest earned um, go? I'm going to defer to either John or the uh, accountant on this car. Interest earned on this goes where? Sure, there are uh, three different accounts that Mr. Woodson asked about. The uh, debt retirement uh, investment account is a series of five CDs. Um, that are used to pay down the first two and a half years of debt service. Uh, one of those is already uh, matured and then used to pay debt. Uh, that any interest earned on those funds uh, is rolled into the debt reserve investment account. Um, the debt reserve investment account is a $15 million account that is for the requirement of the bonds um, that will remain in place for 30 years uh, and is there to ensure that we don't miss any years of uh, debt service. Uh, that currently earns two and a half percent, and uh, any interest earned in that account is reinvested in the same account. Then the final account is the construction fund investment account, uh, earns a much uh, lower interest rate. It's very short term money at 0.1 percent, um, and that is uh, funds that will most likely be uh, utilized in the next 12 months to actually pay these construction bills. And uh, I think as Plan Moran uh, had mentioned earlier, all three of those are fully. Is it safe to say that all interest earned on all accounts stays in the KWA funds and is used solely for the purpose of KWA? It's not transferred to any general fund or any other aspect. Absolutely. Yeah. Our next uh, gentleman to come up was Mr. Pellegrino. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Mr. Pellegrino had some questions on savings, the environment. As far as the uh, environment, between the EPA and the DEQ, uh, we had spent tens of thousands of dollars in many, many months satisfying many requirements by both of those agencies. We had to do studies on what they call the Northern Riffle Shell Plan. Some birds, some uh, Many, many, many different things that required specialists to go out in the field. I do apologize. To go out in the field and do uh, all kinds of research when it comes to the environment, not only for clams, for birds, etc., but for foliage, trees, plants, flowers, bushes, all kinds of things. And we had to hold a series of public hearings um, that all the people that are along this route were invited to to talk about their concerns, etc. There was four or five public hearings. That one in each county in Minnesota. Yeah, one in each county in Minnesota. We had one here. So the public had a lot of opportunities to come to the public meetings. The EPA and the DEQ truly made us go through many, many different steps to prove to them that this isn't a problem for the environment. The property that the pipeline is going down is actually road right of way. So we did not have to acquire private property to put this pipeline down. 99% of this pipeline is being put in existing road right of way that required no purchase of property. Now the county for its water treatment plant did have to purchase an 80-acre parcel of land out on the Lapeer Genesee County line that is totally separate from the KWA. It was purchased by the county using county funds and no KWA funds, and that was purchased by uh, from a private property owner. As far as the pricing on it, the, the bottom line is every study that's been done by the city of Flint's engineers, by independent financial advisors, by everybody that's looked at it, compares what the cost of staying with Detroit was. And there's a, a real report, ROWE put a report together a couple of years ago, and it's one of the basis for the Flint City Council decision to vote to join this project. And that report shows that the Flint residents 
not the Flint and Genesee County residents, but the Flint residents themselves will realize a minimum of a $90 million savings over a 30-year period from KWA to the city of Detroit. Now that was when Detroit was still promising a 4% annual rate increase. And unfortunately, just this week, or last week, Detroit announced an 11.2% rate increase for the people in the suburbs that are still on the system. Just a reminder to all, one of the main driving factors of the two driving factors to get off the Detroit system in the first place, it was the cost, the fact that we were getting double-digit rate increases annually for 10 years in a row. When I became Grand Commissioner of Flint and Genesee County in 2001, paid $8 million to purchase water that year. In 2014, Flint and Genesee County paid $25 million for the same volume of water from the city of Detroit. Detroit's own estimates show that that $25 million will grow to $50 million in the next seven to eight years at the current rate of increase that we're receiving from them. So there was a money factor, plus you have to understand that the existing Detroit pipeline is close to 50 years old. You may, you may or may not remember that Detroit put out 17 different boil orders the last 10 years we were on the system. There was one point in time Detroit cut us off from water for over three days, and that was a very trying time for the county. It wasn't so bad for the city, but it was for the county because at the time we didn't have the storage capability that the city of Flint had, but everybody was under a boil order for that period of time. So reliability became a problem, and cost became a problem, so much so Detroit realized for the reliability aspects, you go back into the Detroit Free Press and the minutes of the Detroit board meetings, Detroit had planned on building a second pipeline for us, to us, and then charging us for it. So to build a pipeline is, is ours now, but if we had taken the initiative and moved forward to build this, Detroit would have built it for us and charged it for us as if we were renters. In this case, there's huge savings potential. I believe the potential is even greater than the $90 million stated in the report, because when that report was done, they were only using a 4 to 5% annual rate increase from Detroit, and those annual rate increases have been between 9 and 12%. So the savings to the people is substantial. Now, does KWA give those savings to the city of Flint? Yes. Does the city of Flint have to pass those savings on to its residents? No. That's where the issue lies. Will the city of Flint use those dollars to rebuild its infrastructure and save even more money? Because you currently lose, literally, millions of gallons a day in leaky pipes. That costs the city money. The more leaky pipes you can correct, the more money you can save. But the bottom line is there's there's potential savings of two to five million dollars a year by being on the KWA versus Detroit. How that money is used is up to the residents, the city council, and the administration of the city of Flint. KWA does not get involved or have any jurisdiction over that part of it. Okay. Leanne, what was your last name? Walters. Walters? Yes. Mr. Wright, you didn't answer my question about the injuries that we're sustaining as residents. Where do you see that coming down? What's going to happen if we're in the same condition from the water we're using from the Flint River? What about the health of the public, sir? It's, well, I think I know what you're talking about, but I'm not 100% sure. The health of the public, let's, let's put it a different way. The, the water. Just a hair from a monk. One month. Explain this to me. I, I, I cannot explain. If the KWA is going to do the same thing that Flint's doing now, I want to know what are our rights. We need protection from that. Thank you. Well, again, we, I don't have any, the KWA doesn't have any jurisdiction, if I can finish, over the city of Flint. The water source that KWA will be using is the exact same water source that Detroit uses. 
It'll be less expensive, but it's the same water source. Lake water is easier and less expensive to treat than river water. I cannot speak for what is or isn't the problem with the Flint treatment plant because we're not involved with it. As drain commissioner or as KWA, all we do is supply untreated water to the government units to do what they do with it. My, and I don't know if the mayor wants to uh, comment on this, but the reality is the treatment plant that Flint has is fully capable of treating lake water and or river water to a safe point to be EPA and DEQ standards. Okay, but... Go ahead. But no, no, no. My question to this is, it goes back to the Flint So you're talking about taking lake water, putting it in a confined space where it's not exposed to bacteria, it's not exposed to sunlight, which it creates bacteria, putting it through a pipe over to a treatment plant. That does not make it dirtier water. It's still lake water. The reservoir that you're talking about is for Genesee County. It has nothing to do with the city of Flint. City of Flint uses the Flint River for emergency backup. The reservoir that the county is using is for emergency backup only. The pipeline will be used directly to supply county customers. That reservoir will only be used when, for whatever reason, the pipeline might go down. That reservoir could have the potential to pick up organics in it, and that's basically the difference between lake water and river water is the level of the organics. But as far as organics in that pipeline, they do not increase from the lake over to the city of Flint or to the county's facility. Again, that reservoir does not service Flint. It will only service Genesee County residents. And I think I already talked to you or talked to the why we didn't put the plant at the lake mainly because we wanted to see City of Flint utilize its existing infrastructure, number one. And there had to be a second plant built by the county anyhow because the existing plant does not have a capacity. Mr. Lambert makes a good point about the fact that you do have two types of water now treated and untreated which gives Flint and everybody else on this system an economic advantage because you'll be able to sell untreated raw water at 10% of the cost of what it would cost to buy treated water. Most heavy water customers, whether it's manufacturing, food processing, etc., they prefer the untreated water because they literally have to take the chlorine and fluoride out of it before they use it in their own process which drives up the cost, and they don't have to do that with untreated water. And when you can sell untreated water for $2.50 a thousand cubic feet, you can encourage development, economic development of water customers in your area. So it gives you two products, treated and untreated water. Well, I'm assuming when you're talking about the 72 inch from Detroit and the 60 inch, you're questioning the difference in the size. The 72 inch from Detroit not only fed Flint and Genesee County, but it has a stub that goes uh, south into Oakland and Macomb County. The 60 inch from the KWA for Care County Water Pipeline is only designed to service Flint and Genesee County and parts of Lapeer and Santa Line. So the diameter is not necessary. That 72 would have been an overbuild for us. It would have been money that we would not have had to spend to make that big a diameter quick.
is our, our board comment period. Uh, I have a few notes uh, to address um, related to the city of Flint. Unless there's objection, I have to go at the end, but I, I thought I'd take these issues on the city of Flint, uh, address them now. Um, I think the, uh, Jeff Wright accurately portrayed you know, the difference here between uh, the Cary County Water Authority and then each community that treats water, including the city of Flint, and that's what I'll speak to. Every financial estimate that was done and uh, presented to the city council back in um, winter and spring of 2013 um, did affirm that there was approximately a $100 million savings uh, to the city of Flint over a 30 year period. But you have to keep in mind that was compared with what was projected to be spent if we stayed on the truck. It, it was not $100 million compared with the actual cost that we're all paying today. It was a projected savings uh, against what was expected to happen with Detroit. And that's an important distinction. Uh, what, what has always been said from the city of Flint's perspective is that the Cary County Water Authority and the cost savings that come from uh, a lower cost supply uh, would stabilize the rates in the city of Flint because we knew we had to make more investments in our infrastructure than we had in the past. So there were savings against Detroit, rates would be stabilized, and we would be able uh, to provide more um, reasonable investments, more um, appropriate investments in our infrastructure in the coming years because of that move to KWA, whereas in the other scenario, we would be paying an escalated rate for the same water from Detroit with no ability to increase our investment in our local infrastructure, which would only further increase costs as that system reaches its, uh, its, its expected age. Uh, it, it's a very challenging environment that we find ourselves in, uh, but that's, that's the, the facts that we face. We maintain a commitment to water that is 100% safe, uh, without exception and without question. I uh, recognize that we, it's very difficult to, to rebuild a community if there are questions about a fundamental need and right like water. Uh, so every effort is being made on that. And for anyone who cares to stay, at 4.30 p.m. there'll be a City Council Public Works Committee meeting uh, during which time you'll hear the, the first suggested improvements from the independent water consultants who have been retained. Um, the, the drain commissioner has been very gracious in offering some, some advice of his own and some perspective. I think uh, we're seeing uh, all of those recommendations, including those provided by Mr. Bocock, uh, affiliated with uh, Ms. Brockovich, uh, that there are steps that can be taken to optimize the city of Flint's uh, treatment process. And then there are investments that need to be made uh, very quickly uh, to improve the distribution system, particularly uh, limiting the amount of time that water is staying within that distribution system, regardless of what source we have, uh, that, that presents a threat uh, to our community that we have to address. And there was one other question about uh, who sits on this board, uh, each participating community, uh, based on the amount of water, uh, percentage of water, that they purchase uh, has the ability to appoint members. So from the city of Flint, where most of the questions about water safety have been centered, uh, you have myself uh, serving under the Articles of Incorporation, uh, the mayor, and the drain commissioners uh, serve on this body. Uh, then we have uh, city council president, uh, Josh Freeman, uh, then city councilman, uh, and now state representative, Sheldon Neely, and then representing our, our business community, uh, Steve Landall graciously um, agreed to serve. Uh, we, we expect that we'll look at those appointments on a, on a periodic basis, so if anyone uh, wants to serve on this authority, uh, then I would encourage you to, to contact me, mayor at cityofflint.com. Uh, we are also uh, building a, a water advisory board, which was referenced. Invitations were sent to approximately 40 entities that have been uh, engaged with us in the last few weeks around water concerns. But that door is open for additional people uh, who would like to participate. Uh, we've received eight or 10 requests. I, I understand all of those will be honored. I expect we'll go on more as they come in. We, we have um, a value on transparency, at least on the 
election officials, and, and we have agreement on that from our current emergency manager. Uh, so we're going to operate in an open fashion, and I encourage anyone to, to contact me as it relates to City of Flint issues um, and, and our participation on this, on this authority. Uh, with that, I'd like to go around, as is our custom, uh, start with you, Trustee Sporczyk, uh, if you have any comment for the body. Just one that would be earlier today, Mr. Commissioner Wright stated that the Peter County can go to the board to stay with the right to sue for our city. Can you speak louder than that, please? I can't hear you. Sure can. Uh, earlier today, it was stated that the Lapeer City decided it wanted to stay with the city of the Detroit water system. I didn't know whether or not, or sorry, I hear about that. I would like to see more people we can get involved in this and she can go be for everyone. But is that their final say on that, or is there something more that this board or uh, we can? Well, I can't speak for that. If it was a 3 2 vote City of Lapeer Commission, they don't refer to them as council members or they refer to them as commissioners. Uh, there's a 3-2 vote, and their stated reason for voting on it at the time was the fact that the City of Detroit had promised them no more than a 4% annual rate increase for the next 10 years. Two weeks after they voted, excuse me, a week after they voted, Detroit told them they would have a minimum rate increase of 11.2% the first year. So I think that they'll revisit the issue, but I can't guarantee that. Their purpose for voting the way they did kind of fell apart. My assumption is they'll look at the issue again. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Henry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a follow-up question on Mr. Uh, Sorocek. Microphone, please. Follow-up question on uh, Mr. Sorocek. What's the volume that the Pearson uses? Minimum. Um, there's, on a hot summer day, what do they peak at, John, about a million gallons? Two million. Their average flow is one million gallons a day. You take that into comparison to Flint, Tennessee County, 30 million gallons a day. So it's about a third of this summer. Thank you. Trustee Tucker, any comments? I don't have anything Us having our own um, 
pump stations and, and mixing stations. I would be more interested to tie into a raw water situation. Um, there's a lot of factories that, uh, especially food processing in Santa County, County's an agricultural area. So um, it's highly likely that any industry that comes off of the pipeline, including Detroit uh, Power Company, does not necessarily want treated water because when you intake treated water, whether you use it for non-contact cooling or um, food production, you have to clean the chemicals out of the water before you use it or set up a, a, a septic system um, to treat the water before you can release it into the atmosphere. So if and when San Juan County ever purchases water from Flint Genesee County, because you, you will be the, the shareholders in this, we will purchase from you at some point if necessary. Um, that, lot, that, that money will help you guys. Not only that, but, uh, but San Juan County's needs for, for raw water are much bigger than, than treated water. We don't, we don't want to treat water, we don't want to be part of that. So, um, one of the things that was brought up by uh, Michigan Agribusiness Association, Jim Byron, He's a tremendous visionary over what could be, and, and sitting there with a raw water pipeline for potential infrastructure and electricity and an extra electricity, um, that looks really good, especially along the I-69 corridor for not only Michigan's future, but our, our relationship with Canada as well. So he sees that as the perfect storm for the future. Um, I'm actually quite excited about the raw water plant, and I wouldn't be interested in purchasing treated water in the future in any regard. Thank you, John. CEO Wright, final comments? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There was one question that I have going through my notes here about um, I have my notes get. It had to do with uh, contracts. It was asked if the contracts are available. I can't remember who asked that. Aren't the contracts on the website? Kevin? Yes. Look up the AWA website, all the contracts, all the rents, all the pertinent information is on that website. So if you want to see what the contract reads, how it reads, the dollar values, etc., they're on that website. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your, your joining us here in the city of Flint today as we continue to move forward with the CARE County uh, Water Authority and our new pipeline. This, this truly is an amazing project for our region. As we heard today, at the, at the peak construction point, there will be over 1,000 people employed. And this is a significant investment in our own future. And I think that's one of the uh, other distinctions that's important to draw. You can look at a budget and talk about how much you spend each year. But you also have to ask, what do you have as a result of that spending? And in our uh, communities have been customers. So uh, the only thing we've had at the end of the year has been the ability to be a customer for another year uh, and continue to send money that's invested in other communities. And this is a very different project. This is one that we all saw having a common interest in where we're able to invest in something uh, that we don't own individually. As we stated, uh, the purpose of this authority is to work on behalf of all of our communities for the specific purpose of providing uh, raw water uh, to each of our communities. But it's important to recognize how uh, the money that we're spending on this project is, is adding to our region. It's not simply paying a bill, and there's an important difference there. But there's also an important responsibility. And it means that, uh, especially speaking on behalf of the city of Flint, we have to take that responsibility very seriously. Uh, we have to ensure that the water that is treated, which is the reason why we need the source water, is 100% safe without exception and can be used to benefit the entire community. Uh, with that, I'd like to take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support? All those in favor, aye. Aye. Nay? Meetings adjourned.